Good morning, everybody. How are you? I'm pretty. Hey, everybody. You made it to Wednesday, February 24th. Way to go. And it is the last school day of the week. Don't show up on Thursday. Don't log in on Thursday. Don't do that. That would be, yeah, sleep. You know, sleep. It's good. All right, so... Um, today, what we're going to do is we're going to run you through the in case you missed it video of all the things that we did in class. And if you're watching this, that means you didn't come to class today for some reason. Maybe, maybe you couldn't make it here. Maybe, I don't know, the bus didn't pick you up. Maybe you couldn't make it here because your internet wasn't working. Maybe you weren't feeling well. Maybe you had to take care of your little brothers and sisters. You know what? It's all okay. You know, because you, you, you popped on here. So we're good. Um, I hope you're well. I hope those around you are well. And I, and I hope you have, I don't know, I hope you get some rest this weekend. All right, I've been tired this week. This this whole like coming back to school thing, woof, woof, throw me off. All right, so um, we're gonna go through four slides. We're gonna wrap up the Great Depression today, and we're gonna look at some big ideas. Don't forget, you have an assignment due you know, today's Wednesday, due tonight by midnight. And if you can't get that in to me, get that in as soon as you can, because I'll be working on those over the long weekend. Um, other than that, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Hit me up. Um, the random fact on my board today is uh, there are 293 different ways to make change for a dollar. So I don't know. Maybe you could spend a lot of time figuring that out. Okay. Here we go. So yesterday we talked about the depression that went from 1929 to 1941. We talked about the causes. We talked about how there was like this spiral of events that pulled in more and more and more people. And sometimes even the people that weren't pulled in were were so afraid to spend their money or even keep their money in the banks that it that it, it made the problem worse. Okay. A lot of people blamed Herbert Hoover, who was the president, we said, because he's in charge. And, and that's what we do. We, we tend to, to point at the person who's in charge. Fair or not fair, it's the way it goes. And so today we're going to do is we're going to pick up with the idea that, that people were kind of willing to do anything to survive. Um, obviously, the, you know, there people in all walks of life, all, all kinds of different lifestyles get affected by the depression. Um, you know, the poor, they're poor. They, they didn't have money in banks. They didn't have savings to lose. They didn't have um, stock, but they, some of those people lost jobs, at the factories that they worked at. Uh, the rich, I mean, some people are just so rich, it doesn't touch them. But there are people that are like millionaires at breakfast and they're broke at dinner time. you know, don't have any place to live. Minorities, obviously, it's American history. You know that they were the first ones fired. Women were, were out the door. Um, people that hired uh, minorities and women paid them poorly, even more poorly during the depression. depression. And there wasn't a lot of help out there for people like that right away. Um, the middle class, though, gets hit really hard. They're, they're the people that are using the installment plan to buy things. They're the people that had you know, like savings in the bank. And they were the ones that were margin buying. Remember the buy now, pay later with stocks. So the middle class gets hit really hard. One of the really big problems that happens is we have a number of Americans that that either couldn't make their house payments, that um, couldn't pay their rent, or, or basically couldn't afford a place to live. And so homelessness um, goes through the roof during uh, the Great Depression. And outside of towns, these little... Um, I'll call them shanty towns. Imagine like ice fishing shanties, but junky ones outside a town, like built up in these little villages and, and people were living there and, um, you know, using out, using fires for warmth and things. And they called those Hoovervilles as, as a, as a diss to Herbert Hoover, because look, I'm here because Herbert, Herbert Hoover can't figure out a way to help me. And, and so, and so that becomes a problem. Um, People with kids, um, there there are some really strange things. Uh, people drop kids off at fire departments and police departments. There's actually a, in the law it, you can do that. Um, the, a, adoption, or I'm sorry, kids going to orphanages go up, go up crazy high. If you've ever seen Annie, the the little redheaded girl, or the new version, I, I don't. I've never seen that one. You know, the sun will come up tomorrow. Uh, you, you have a number of kids in orphanages. There are even cases that I've read about, about people, um, you know, um, not killing like kids, but like babies. Um, some families, if you had a, a relative that was well off, maybe you would send your kids to live with them. There were even families that like rented out their kids to other families, almost like nannies or cleaners. Um, and so it was really kind of a time where that whole being a teenager thing maybe took a step back 
so that you could help your family out in some way. People were also hungry. Um, and so churches and social groups, even, even Al Capone in Chicago, um, started soup kitchens and bread lines, a place where you could come and, and get a meal. Um, you know, a cup of coffee, a, a bowl of soup, a, a sandwich, you know, nothing, nothing crazy. You're not getting like a prime rib or anything. But, you know, places started doing holiday meals. And the problem was people would, would line up for, for blocks to get this free meal because they were hungry and they didn't have the money to buy food. Uh, the problem is some people would have rather starved because they were too proud to admit they had a problem. They didn't want to see people stand, have people see them in the bread line. They didn't want to admit that, that their life wasn't going well. And they didn't want other people to see them. And, and generally people just became afraid of the future. The idea that yesterday sucked, today sucked, tomorrow is probably going to suck. And the day after that's going to be even worse. So not, not why bother, but why expect that anything's going to get better. And while President Hoover was trying to do things. He, he kind of had this, now ah, these things happen, it's going to fix itself, we just need to keep doing the things we're doing and everything's going to be fine. Um, but he absolutely did not really like the idea of providing direct relief. Now direct relief means I give you something to help you now. So like stimulus payments, the, the, the stimulus payments we've gotten during, during coronavirus, um, extra, you know, like free food, things like that. He, he kind of thought those things were kind of, in a way kind of un-American. He thought that we wanted to work for the things we had and we wanted to feel proud of ourselves. And if somebody gave us something that would make us feel bad about ourselves, it's tough. I, I, I mean, I understand what he was probably thinking, but at the same time, I, I, can, I can be sad and still not be hungry. So um, he did do some things though. Like he, he, federally funded the building of the Boulder Dam, which is, is now called the Hoover Dam, which gave thousands of people jobs um, building that. And it also provided energy to the area of the country where it was set up. Um, he also started what was called the refinance, or I'm sorry, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and the RFC, which gave loans to banks to reopen. The problem was as soon as the banks reopened, People panicked again. They, the people that had originally lost their money went in, got their money out, and a lot of the banks reclosed. And so while the Hoover Dam is cool, it's huge, the, the, a lot of his other plans fell short of, of trying to help the way that maybe people had hoped. And so in 1932, there was an election. Um, Hoover ran again as a Republican because I think the Republicans just were like, eh. He's already been president during the Depression. We're already screwed. We're probably going to lose anyway. So Hoover, vote for him. The Democrats ran Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He's a cousin of Teddy Roosevelt. He had had experience as the governor of New York. Now, remember, the stock exchange is in New York. So it's kind of like the, the beginning. We'll use the term ground zero of the Depression. And he had figured out ways to make things better in New York. And he offered the people a new deal. He, he called his program the New Deal. And it basically centered on three ideas. The amount, the idea of relief. How can we help you now? Do you need money? Do you need food? Do you need clothes? Do you need shelter? Like, like how do we provide the things that you need to get to tomorrow? Then there's recovery. Recovery is help you help yourself. So we're going to get you jobs, basically. All right, we're going to figure out you know ways to ways to get you a paycheck so that you can do something moving forward. And then the third step, once relief and recovery are done, we'd move to reform. Reform basically is make sure it doesn't happen again. Relief help you now. Recovery help you help yourself. Reform make sure it doesn't happen again. Those are three really important concepts. I hope maybe you're you're writing down what they meant. Roosevelt wins big. It's a, it's a landslide. And is in, in his inauguration address, or the big speech that you give when you get sworn in, he says this line that, that really sticks with me in a lot of ways. Um, and, and the line is, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. So he's like, we're afraid of being afraid. We're, we're afraid of the future. We're afraid of tomorrow. But you think about when you were little. You were afraid of the dark, prob probably. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe you weren't. All right. But if you were afraid of the dark, I want you to think about what you were really afraid of. Were you afraid of your door? Were you afraid of your dresser? Were you afraid of your closet? No, you were afraid of the things you couldn't see that, that you thought might be there. And Roosevelt really believed that 
one of the things that was holding us back was our own fear that we pulled our money out of the bank and we wouldn't spend it, that we wouldn't say that we needed help because we were afraid someone would judge us. And, and so he, he, he basically said, listen, guys, we're going to do this together, but you got to, you got to have the right attitude about things. And right away he put things in motion. All right. Literally on the first evening of his presidency, he, he got going. Um, some things that kind of made him unique. He realized that he wasn't a genius in everything. And so he formed a group of people that he called a brain trust, a brain trust, like a thinking group. And he said, you're the, the best people that I have in your field. I want you to come up with ideas to solve the depression. If they fail, we're already, we're already in a bad spot. So that's okay. But then just try to fix it. And he had certain people working on certain parts of life. You know, I'm not an expert when it comes to farming. Jordan Krause is a senior. He knows a lot about farming. And so if I were going to do a brain trust about, about life in Marshall, Jordan would be my guy for farming. Okay. Um, if I were going to do one on like Little America, I personally have never been to Little America, but some of you maybe have been a lot. Maybe some of you guys are going to work there this summer. You could be my brain trust. Um, I mean, there, there's a lot of people I know in this town who have been here a long time who I would pick them to help me because they, they know. I can't, I can't always know. The other thing that he did, and I thought this is an interesting move, he started doing these things called fireside chats. He he conferred with like a lot of the broadcasting corporations, the radio corporations at the time, and they came to the White House and they set up a microphone in, in the in the White House. And every Sunday he would do this little radio show where he'd be like, "Listen, here's what's going on in the country. Here's what we're trying to do. Here's what you can expect this week. Here's what we we did last week." And then he would answer some mail. And he was honest, like you know, sometimes he was like, you know, we just couldn't figure that. We can't figure that out. We're working on it. Or this is what we're doing. You know, well, Billy from Connecticut wants to know, and it, it put people at ease because. When you're afraid because you don't know what's going on, maybe someone should tell you what's going on. And, and FDR really felt that way. And so he understood that he couldn't possibly do something that was going to help everybody at once. There wasn't any magical that was going to fix everything. I mean, sure, you can send everybody a stimulus check, but that doesn't give them their jobs back. That doesn't get the virus to go away. That doesn't solve the stock market going like this. That doesn't solve coronavirus around the world. It helps now, but it, but you got to understand that Roosevelt, and, and I think this is what people are doing now, understood that you kind of had to, had to pinpoint certain things. So I'm going to work on, he's going to fix the bank system. And then, and then they're going to help farmers. And they're going to figure out ways to get the stock market going. And then they're going to get people jobs. And then they're going to stabilize the economy for the future. So it's not that you can go, here, this will fix everything. Oh, it's that we're going to fix this. Okay. Now I know you you over here. I'm going to fix this thing over here. You over here, this might not help you. And so you might be like, why not me? Chill. It's okay. We're going to give you the direct relief now while we recovery and reform that. And then we'll get to you and then we'll get to them and then we'll get to them. All right. Helping farmers might jack up the price of a, of a gallon of milk. And you're going, dude, I can't even afford milk to begin with. Now the price is higher. We'll get to you. All right, it's that kind of situation. Patience is a virtue, my friends. It's just a hard one to learn, hard one to respect. And so FDR, his brain trust, and Congress started passing all these laws. And, and Congress just generally was like, yep, good, yep, good. Because they understood that if things went right, they could pat themselves on the back. And if things went wrong, they could point at FDR and went, that guy did it. There we go. And so FDR did a number of different things, and they called a lot of his programs alphabet soup. I'm going to go through these relatively quickly. I kind of highlighted the first letter of some of these words because they're known as like the NRA, AAA, TVA, FERA, CCC, WPA, Social Security is just Social Security. Okay, so one thing that Roosevelt did, and this is kind of a trick, is he declared a bank holiday. And what they did is they shut down every bank in the country for a small period of time. And they sent people in to look at some of the banks. But basically what they told you is we're inspecting every bank in the country. We're going to go in and we're going to check every bank in the country. If the bank reopens, it's a strong bank and you can trust it. If the bank closes, we're going to pass this thing. They called it FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, that insures your money in the bank. 
we still have FDIC today. Something would happen to FNM Bank, my money in FNM Bank is insured and it would be returned by the federal government even if the bank closes. So they bank holiday, they close all the banks. And they stay closed for a little bit. And people are freaking out because my bank isn't reopening, my bank isn't reopening. And then they all reopen. Everyone goes, oh, my bank is good. I can put my money back in there. I, can, I, I don't have to worry. They've got the little FDIC sticker. My money's insured. And slowly but surely, banking gets a little bit better. Then they pass the National Recovery Administration, the NRA, not the National Rifle Association. That's different. Okay. And the NRA basically started, it didn't make minimum wage a law, but it established like what were acceptable work hours, eight hour shifts, anything more than that's overtime. And so rather than hiring somebody and having them work 14 hours and paying them eight regular hours and six hours of overtime, you could hire one person to work the first shift one person worked the second shift. It also established a minimum wage. Now that minimum wage was unequal depending on who you were. Classic, okay. Eventually a federal minimum wage gets passed toward the end of the Great Depression. It isn't much that time period in history. And to be totally honest, sometimes I don't think it's that much now, all right. But the National Recovery Administration kind of helped businesses and workers get pay and hours figured out. You have the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which helped farmers, the AAA, not, not to fix your car, but Agricultural Adjustment Act. They actually looked at farmers and they said, you're producing too much. And so that's making your prices really low and people aren't able to buy all the things. So it's rotting in grocery stores. So plant less. And farmers went, what do you mean? They went, well, you've got two fields. This year, plant this field. We'll give you a subsidy or an extra payment not to plant this one. And then next year, plant this field and rotate your crops so you take good care of the fields. And we're going to give you subsidies. And if there's a bad year where stuff doesn't grow, like, I don't know, it's too dry, it's too wet, the dust bowl happens, we'll talk about on the next slide, the government comes in and helps farmers out. Now, the one thing that frustrated people about this is that meant that the price of corn went up. And dairy farmers, in some cases, were, were dumping milk out it, to, to produce less. And pork... Pork rancher, I don't know, is a pork rancher, pork farmer? I don't even know, okay? I feel stupid right now. They, they said, don't slaughter all the hogs. Well, the price of pork went up, and people were like, oh, my God, I can't afford this food to begin with. How, are, how am I going to help? Roosevelt went, wait, we're going to get you some relief, and here we go. The TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority. Tennessee has a bunch of rivers. They flood every year. They ruin a bunch of houses. Insurance companies have to pay for the money, or the family has to try to pay to fix the house. So Roosevelt goes, hmm comes up with the TVA. The TVA build, builds dams to, to like control the water so it doesn't flood the area. This solves a lot of problems. First of all, there's jobs, building the dams and then working at the dams. Two, the houses aren't getting ruined every year. The insurance money isn't getting collected. And then three, the area gets cheap, almost free electricity. And because the electricity is so cheap, Roosevelt goes, businesses should move here and start factories because we can get you cheap stuff. And so all of a sudden, people in that area have jobs. You have FERA, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, that gave $500 million in direct relief. It's, it's like our, our coronavirus aid. Okay, It's like our stimulus checks that, that people have been getting. Some other things, you had the CCC that gave men between the ages of 18 to 25 jobs working in national parks, doing things like you know clearing the trails, build, putting up the signs, building little cabins for people to stay at. It's your general park stuff. You had the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. Um, they did things like built schools or built courthouses, um, built public buildings. Uh, part of the old elementary school that used to be in the parking lot over by the ELC, I'm pointing like you can see my hand, um, that used to be over by the ELC, part of that was built by the WPA. They had programs to support the arts. Like if you were a singer, they paid you to go around and sing in towns, free concerts, concerts at schools. Painters painted murals in towns, murals in schools. Artists got paid to paint. Writers got paid to write because they didn't want the arts to die because they were afraid that, you know, the next great painter would go, well, I got to go to the work, go to the factory and make toasters because I, I got to eat. And they didn't want to eliminate the culture. But probably the biggest change that happens, probably the one that, that has the longest impact and has caused the most debate is the Social Security Administration. Okay. It has three parts. Most people don't realize this. It provides like a payment to people over a certain age when they retire or hit that age. It allowed people to retire at a younger age. People used to have to work until the day that they died. And that freed up jobs for younger people. 
The second part is it gives unemployment insurance. If you are working at a job and they look at you and go, hey, sorry, we've got to let you go or hey, you're fired, you can register for unemployment and you get a percentage of your check while you're looking for your next job. And last but not least, it helps out people that are disabled. It's, it's disabled, blind, needy, elderly, widows, and children who have lost a parent or both parents will receive a social security check. Now that's kind of a good reform. It, it helps them now, but it also helps things out in the future. Now I simplified that way down. If you ever have any questions about any of that stuff, please let me know, okay? All right, number eight, last slide. It helped, kind of. It didn't, it didn't fix everything. Some critics believe that he was giving away money, that, that he was jacking up the national debt, that the balance, the budget wasn't balanced, and we can't give people money, that's not American, and political parties argued about it, and the word welfare starts getting used, and all that stuff. Some critics didn't think he did enough. People wanted free college educations. They wanted every family given $1,000 a year, a free car, a house, all those things. And, and so you're never going to make everybody happy no matter what you're doing. Women and minorities were often discriminated against in the plants. They, they, tend to focus, they tended to focus on the majority, which at that time was the, the power majority, which at that time was white males. He did do little things along the way, but they didn't seem like as big a change as maybe some of the other things. Meanwhile, in the Midwest, we're experiencing something called the Dust Bowl. Farmers had overfarmed. They didn't know about crop rotation. They were destroying the soil. We had a couple years of drought and really high winds. And basically, the farm fields blew away and they piled up like snowdrifts. There were cases where school got canceled because there were dirt drifts in the road. Um, cows died because they couldn't breathe. And when they opened them up, their lungs were full of dirt. And so a lot of Midwestern Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska farmers went, screw this. And they left and they just left their farm fields there to rot. The people that stayed started to do things differently. They had to be patient. They had to, you know, start to learn about wind erosion. They had to learn about crop rotation. They had to learn about irrigation. But obviously, eventually, we bounced back. All right. The Great Depression is a time of massive government spending. We, we pour a lot into our own economy, sometimes more than we're bringing in in taxes. That obviously causes a deficit and, and kind of puts our country in debt. FDR decided toward the end of the New Deal that he wanted to balance the budget a little bit more, that he wanted to try to cut back on some of the spending because things were getting better so they didn't have to spend as much. Okay. Meanwhile, by 1937, things seem to be improving. But there are other countries in the world that are in depressions too. And there are other rulers, that guy right there, who come up with ways to solve the depression in their own country. And that's gonna lead us to what we're gonna talk about next, which is World War II. All right, so hey, finish your assignment. Listen, Monday, Monday you don't have to come to school. Monday you don't have to log into class, but teachers are gonna upload work for you to do. I'm gonna upload a really short test on the, on the 1920s and the Great Depression, and I'm also gonna upload your World War II work for next week. Nothing crazy, I promise, okay? All right, but th that's what Monday's gonna be. So make sure you log in on Monday, check your work. If there's anything you gotta do right away, do it, okay? If you have any questions, let me know. Have a great weekend. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.